2 Corinthians 11, I went to pick up Pastor Rock at the airport the other day, and we met for the first time and shook hands and hugged and helped him with his luggage, and <clears throat> he began to talk to me, and the more he talked, I looked at him and I said, you know, your voice sounds familiar to me. And he said, well, maybe it's the sermons I preach on Sermon Audio. And I said, no, I've heard your voice before. And we talked, and, and finally it dawned on me. He sounds like the guy that called me about my Microsoft Windows computer. <laughs> yeah. Only he said his name was Rocky or something, you know, Chuck or something. Anyway, he, he is, uh, he has, a, I can say that he's got a great sense of humor. He's like me. And uh, we have, we've had a wonderful time this weekend, and uh, it's just been good fellowshipping with him. And you pray for his wife. He married Grace. That's her name, Grace. Yeah, Lordson and Grace, and they have a son, Israel, and your second son is Stephen. And so they have another one on the way, and due in November, so praise the Lord for that. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 10, um, we are getting close to being done with this part of it. Um, 2 Corinthians eleven ten: as the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth, but what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And I'm going to, I won't be, I won't be doing it today, but we're going to look at the office of apostle and what the qualifications for uh, were for that particular office, and is it true that the, apost- the, the office of apostle has been handed down throughout the, throughout the years and throughout the generations? I say no. We have the apostles already. Christ chose them. Paul was one of them. And there are no more. And that's the foundation of the church. The apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And when you, I'm, boy, here I'm getting into, I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, so we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing. If his ministers, Satan has ministers. Well, that's scary, isn't it? If his ministers um, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, uh, last week we talked about false brethren. I'd like for you to turn to Mark chapter 4 very quickly. I'm not going to go through this like I did last Sunday. I'm just going to use it for our guide In Mark chapter 4, verse 14, The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that is sown in their hearts. So uh, Pastor Rock, has he has a ministry where they pass out gospel tracts uh, out on the street. A lot of those are just cast by the wayside. Satan cometh immediately. And taketh away the word that was sown there. And then, but then you have these are they likewise, verse 16, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. The gospel or the Bible hasn't made them angry yet, but it will. And they have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, 
and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. Three things here. Think Genesis 3. Think lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. What did Jesus do to a tree that was unfruitful? He cursed it. And it was to be cut down and cast into the fire. So we're looking at the setup here for the false brethren. There will be people uh, who come to church who will make a false claim of salvation. Um, and so let's look at some of the examples the Bible gives us. 1 Samuel chapter 10, turn there. 1 Samuel 10. I want to hear your Bible pages. That's good. That's what I like to hear. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Who was doing that, by the way? <laughs> She's a clown like the rest of us. Donna, you fit right in here. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 9. Uh, this is Saul. And Saul, we're going to see a change in Saul's life. He starts out good finishes bad that is uh second peter is it second peter chapter two where it talks about the dogs returning to their own vomit that's what saul did first samuel chapter 10 verse 9 and it was so that when he had turned his back to go from samuel god gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass that day and when they came thither to the hill behold a company of prophets met him the spirit of god came upon him speaking of saul and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, what is this that is come under the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Because he was prophesying. And so think about it. How many, how many ministers... How many pastors, how many churches, how many denominations that years ago were preaching right? Only as time goes on for them to turn away from the word of God, turn away from the King James. He was, pastor was telling me about the, the Bible college you went to where they were supposed to be King James. That's what they told everybody that they were. But when he's sitting in the classroom, they're saying, well, the King James has errors in it. It has mistakes in it. It's not right in everything that it says. So at one time, they believed it. But then as time goes on, they compromise, they change their position. Can I tell them what they told you? Because I have a big mouth. You tell me something, I'm going to tell everybody. I shouldn't work for the CIA. They, he asked them, what should I tell the people that I preach to about the King James? Should I tell them that it has mistakes in it? And they said, no, don't tell them that. Just preach it. But don't tell them that you think it has mistakes in it. Well, that's being dishonest. That's appearing to be one thing when in reality, you're not what you present to people. That's a hypocrite. That's a scribe and a Pharisee is what Jesus was talking about. So over time, these men, they begin to compromise. They begin to change their their position, they, and they do it secretly, they do it subtly, they don't want to be found out, but that's really who they are. Saul is, is Saul also among the prophets. And I want you to think about how he starts, but think about how he ended. He starts being one of the prophets, but the end of his life, God had nothing to do with this man because he stepped away and despised God's word. So verse 12, and of the same place answered and said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb 
is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. Now, turn to 1 Samuel 15. This is where Saul makes his change. Saul, to me, is a picture of stony ground. He receives the word with gladness. It looks good for a while. But then these people get a hardness in their heart. And you can't change their mind. They won't be. They won't change because of the word of God. They'll come to a place where to them the Bible is wrong and they're right. And that's all there is to it. They'll say, well, the Bible has mistakes in it. The Bible has errors in it or whatever. And they are the ones who correct the Bible. I used to do this. I know what I'm talking about. First Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. So which is better? To offer a sacrifice for your sin or to obey God so you don't have to offer a sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better. It's the only thing in the Bible that's better than the cross. Is to obey what God said and do what God said and to honor his word. So he said, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. In verse 23, and we know this verse, we know it well, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's what rebellion is. And rebellion against what God said. Now Saul, he's going to offer, if you study this chapter, and I want to encourage you, I'm kind of moving a little quickly here. But I encourage you to study this chapter because what Saul does is that he insists that he did do what God said. He's not, he's, he's trying to convince Samuel, he may have convinced himself that what he did was right. And he tries to, this is what he does. He self justifies his actions. Who is the justifier of man? It is God who justifies. It is God who sanctifies. It is God. God wants the, the, the glory, the pleasure, the blessing of taking a sinner and by Christ's blood sanctifying that sinner and justifying that sinner so that they present themselves to God as if they had never sinned. So in eternity... We are praising God for justifying us who we know we've sinned and God justifies us and we stand before God as if we had never done anything wrong. We stand as Christ stands before God, totally justified and God wants that glory. So when you justify your own sin, will a man rob God? Yeah. Yeah. He'll rob God of God's justification. Um, you may know somebody that lives a certain way that's wrong scripturally and yet they will justify it. They'll say, well, I believe I'm right because of this or I believe I'm right because of that. Uh, I told this story, I, I worked with a guy one time that he was, him and his wife and children were attending a church, but he was having an adulterous relationship with another woman in that church. And to me, he was telling me about it because he, I guess he thought that I would say it was okay. Because what he said was, I, you know, now that I think of it, I really don't think that God intended for me and my wife to be together. God intended for me and this other woman to be together. And that's how he justified it. And I said, let me tell you something. If you made a covenant before Almighty God that you were going to be faithful to this woman who you have children with, 
then I suggest you honor your commitment and your vow to this woman because that's the only thing that God has pleasure in. If you think that you can carry on this adulterous affair with this other woman and think that God is okay with that, you are wrong. So, but that's what he was doing. He was justifying his own sin and that's what Saul was doing. He did what he did and then he justified himself in doing it. But I did obey God. I did, and he's adamant about this. Which means he's not sorry that he did. So, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So now in verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected, and he says it twice, you've rejected the word of the Lord. What is that? That's your Bible. You don't reject the Bible. You obey the Bible. You keep God's word. You keep his commandments. You keep, you hold on to his word. You never let it go. It is the one that leads and guides your life. This Bible, listen, I'm telling you, this Bible will do great things in your life. This Bible will save you. This Bible will lead you. This Bible will guide you. This Bible, this Bible is everything for Christian life and Christian walk and Christian holiness. This Bible will be, is your best friend in the world. This Bible is. This, this Bible will tell you things that not even your closest friend can tell you. This Bible will tell you those things. Things that we need to hear. Don't reject it. Don't turn your back on it. Not one verse. Not one chapter. Not one place out of this. Believe it all. So, God's rejected Saul. And Saul tries to repent. And Samuel won't hear it. And God specifically said, God said this to David. He told David, David, I'm not going to let you build a house, but the son that you have, the one come that comes from you, well, I will be his father and he will be my son. And if he commit transgression, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of men, but my mercy will I not take from him as I took it from Saul. He specifically mentioned that he took his mercy away from Saul and he would not hear his confession. He would not forgive his sin. That's scary. That's scary. And if you go look at and you compare Solomon's life with Saul, Solomon, how many sins did he commit? Lots of them. But he always kept the wisdom that God had given him, and he kept God's word. And at the end of his life, God allows Solomon to write the book of Ecclesiastes, and in 12 chapters, he's telling us what he did and what he went through, and he's telling us, guys, it's not worth it. It's vanity, it's vexation. And God justified Solomon and forgave every one of those transgressions. Saul committed his sin against the word of God. He rejected the word of the Lord. And folks, what is it? What else do we have that binds us to God? What else do we have that connects us to God but his word? If you reject this, there's nothing between you and God. God can't talk to you. He can't deal with you. He can't chasten you. He can't correct you. He can't instruct you in righteousness. He cannot perfect you because all of those things are done by the word of the Lord. And that's what Saul rejected. And God took his mercy away from him. And here you have it right here. Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. So first Chronicles turn there. First Chronicles 10, 13. I want you to see this in your Bible and I want you to underline it. First Chronicles 10. Pastor and I agree that when Saul, he was in fear of the battle that he was going to face the next day. 
and he inquired of the Lord, and the Lord wouldn't speak to him. The, Lord, the Bible specifically says God would not speak to him by prophet, by Urim, and by vision. God was not going to speak to Saul. God was going to be silent to Saul. And so Saul then turned to the woman at Endor who had a familiar spirit. And the Bible specifically tells you what the woman saw coming up out of the earth. She said, I see gods coming up out of the earth. And one of them has a mantle. And the Bible says Saul perceived that it was Samuel. But was it Samuel? Look at 1 Chronicles 10, 13. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against what? The word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. That was not Samuel standing there. Think what we've been in 2 Corinthians 11, what we've been talking about. Another spirit, another gospel, another Jesus. It was a false Samuel standing there. And that's where he was getting his quote-unquote revelations from. It was a familiar spirit. It was not God. God was not going to talk to him. So God cleared. And the sin that Saul committed was his transgression against the word of the Lord, the Bible. Now, there may be days where you don't read the Bible. There may be days where you may read some of it and it's hard to understand. There may be times when you understand the Bible, you just don't like what it says. Okay, everybody experiences those days. But to then reject what your Bible says to you. This is why, this is reason 4,812. Why I believe my Bible is right in everything that it says. Because I'm commanded by, by this whole story here. I'm taught that I can trust God's word for what it says and if somebody tells me that my Bible's wrong, they're wrong and my Bible's right. Amen. Always. Right. See, this is why he and I get along so well. It's because we both share this book tying us together, making us brothers, giving us good fellowship one with another. He loves the King James. I love the King James. That's it. That's all I need to know about him. Amen. It's all I need to know. So that's, that's your stony ground Christian right there. I, Christian, That's your stony ground church member. They get offended at something the Bible says and they don't like it. And they think they can pick and choose what to do and what not to do. They think they can pick out of the Bible the parts that they're going to believe and the parts they're going to live by. And the rest of it, they don't have to. And whether it's Christian living, whether it's tithing, whether it's uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, or whatever. There are people who pick and choose parts of the Bible that they're going to live and parts that they're not going to live. And we don't get that choice. Now, you may do things that are wrong. I do things that are wrong. We all do things that are wrong. But at least we keep the word so that when we do things that are wrong, the Word is there to correct us. The Word is there to bring us back into righteousness. The Word is there for our benefit. God's not going to hurt you with this book. Don't ever let it go. Don't do it. Turn to Numbers chapter 14. That's one example. False brethren. He was there for a while. But Saul ended up not liking what God said. He thought he could disobey and that he could spiritual, he could do it, he could do it for God's reasons. You see, that's what Saul did. Saul said, 
But my intention was to worship God with all these things that we kept alive. We were going to sacrifice them to the Lord. And Samuel said, Saul, that's not what I told you. And that's, you know what? A lot of people do that. They'll justify it with some spiritual excuse saying, well, I'm doing this for the Lord. Uh, I told him that the Buddhist and Hindu practices from India have swept through America so much now that we have churches that are practicing yoga. Yoga, the word yoga means connect or yoke. And it's a connection to Shiva, the goddess. Connection with, a, with another god. And they're doing that in churches. Teaching it in school. P.E. Good grief. But they're justifying it saying it's Jesus yoga. Listen, God never teaches you to do yoga to connect to God. You want to get, you want to get with God? Open the book. Now Numbers 14. In Numbers, if you look in Numbers 13... Number 13, Moses selected one man from all the 12 tribes to spend 40 days in Canaan land. And they were there to spy out the land. They were there to survey the land to see what was in it and to come back and report to Moses and to the Israelites what it was they saw. They came back with a testimony of how great the land was. Two men on a big pole on their shoulders suspending one whole cluster of grapes. That tells you that cluster of grapes was huge. And the Bible says in Isaiah, new wine is, comes from the cluster. And what it was, those two men were a symbol of the Old and New Testament that is brought into a person's life that... The, that new wine is a picture of the Spirit, the new covenant. And these two men are the Old and New Testament bringing the two witnesses of God's Word in to the Israelites. They had the, the symbol of God's promise right before their eyes. And ten of the spies said, we saw the giants, we saw the sons of Anak there, their cities and their buildings and their walls, are, they reach up into heaven, and they said, there's no way in the world that we can go in there and conquer those giants. And the people believed those men. But you have Joshua and Caleb pleading with the Israelites, saying, don't listen. God said that that land was ours. God said he'd feed us those people, those giants for breakfast. God said that we could go in. God said he would, he would uh, kill all of our enemies. God said they wouldn't be able to stand against us. Come on, let's go and get the promise that God promised us. And so in Numbers 14, verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. The whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? You know, I've thought that. I've had that thought before. Wouldn't it be easier to just go back to the time before you started living for God. And persecution arises. When it gets hard. When it gets difficult. And you think. I'm not going to make it. Why did I ever leave Egypt? And so look at what they did. In verse 4. They said one to another. Let us make a captain. And let us return into Egypt. I said, let's go. Let's find us a leader. 
somebody that can take us back to Egypt and we'll go and we'll submit to Pharaoh again. That's the dog returning to his vomit. That's the sow, the swine, returning to her wallowing in the mire. Let's go back to Egypt. And here's, so here's what we see. We see churches that instead of getting deeper into the word of God, the church then turns and says, we're going to go and remake our church. We're going to make it look like Egypt. We're going to play rock music. We're going to put our Bibles down. We're going to rearrange everything and be just like the world. And that's how we're going to save everybody. So churches turn and go back to Egypt. They go back to the wallowing in the mire. They go back to the vomit that they came from. Listen, people, the temptation's always going to be there. I had a friend in Bible college, and we were pretty good friends. He was, he was several years older than me, and he had been out in drugs. He had been out in the scene of the world, and he had done a lot of worldly things. And every now and then we'd go to a buffet because we were young and had money and liked to eat. And I remember he would sit back after eating like 80 crab legs or something like that. And, and he'd say, boy, I wish I had a cigarette right now. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. Best thing after a meal like this is a nice big cigarette. And I'm going, No. But he used to tell me about all the drugs he took and what they did. He used to tell me about all the parties that he went to. And I didn't recognize in him what he was doing. What he was doing was, I'm thinking about going back to Egypt. And every time we'd have a break at school, he would go back to Joplin, Missouri, which is where he came from. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was hooking back in with his old buddies. And that's how he lived. And after I left that school, and we didn't see each other anymore, he fell all the way back into sodomy. That's how far he went. And I've connected with him on Facebook several years ago only to find out that that's who he is. He's gone probably farther back to Egypt than he ever was to start with. See, it is worse the second time around. It's far worse. Just like life the second time around is far better with Jesus, going back to Egypt is far worse than it ever was. And this is what Israel is ready to do. And God now has taken notice of their willingness to not go in and believe God. See, it's all about what God said, isn't it? Caleb is reminding these people what God said. God said we could have that land. God said he would, he would pursue our enemies. God said they wouldn't be able to stand against us. It is about what God said and what God promised. And they reject the word of the Lord. And so how many of these Israelites lived long enough to see the entrance into Canaan land? Just two. Joshua and Caleb. So in Numbers 16, we have another story. False brethren. In fact, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Turn to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. You believe in giants? 
You should. Because that was the, pretty much the number one reason why Israel did not want to go into the promised land. It was because of the giants. Now, if these guys were just normal guys, it's not a problem. But they specifically recognized that these men were the, from the sons of Anak, the sons of that giant, and they were giants, and they were men of great stature, great and tall, and they had built walls and buildings that reached up into heaven. They were so high, they were insurmountable. And so, Hebrews 3 is, I believe, Paul writing in Hebrews, his teaching about this event in Numbers 14. So he says, verse 7 of Hebrews 3, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's what stony ground people do. They harden their heart and they harden it against what God said. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. See, he specifically mentions the 40 years because God said, okay, the spies were in the land 40 days. I'm going to make them walk a year for every day that they were in there. And in 40 years time, every one of the Jews that left Egypt died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. So, verse 10, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter in to my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest... There be in any of you an evil heart of what? It's not about your works. It's your belief. Do you really trust what God said? And I know it's hard at times. I know that and I have been through time. When I struggled so bad, believing what God said, believing things God had promised me, I struggled with them. One day, my wife and I sitting in the car, and I said, honey, tell me this Bible's right. And she said, you know it is. So I know the struggle. I've, I've. Your faith, you read 1 Peter, your faith is always going to be on trial. But your, the trial of your faith is much more precious than gold that perisheth. Much more precious. I would rather have solid faith in God than any dollar amount in this world. I'd rather have that. And so, uh, verse 13, but exhort one another daily. So this is why we come to church, right? This is, why, this is a good reason to be on Facebook. And not an evil reason. Use Facebook or use social media to encourage people. Not cast them down all the time. Not nitpick their life about every little thing they do that you can nail them. Ah, I see what they're doing. I'm going to nail them for that. We're to encourage, we're to exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of what? Sin. Sin will change your doctrine. Sin will harden your heart against God's word. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until how long? To the end. Hold on to it. Don't let it go. Don't let this Bible go. Trust in it every day. It is going to be challenged. Your faith is going to be on trial. There's going to be things that show up on the internet where they're going to supposedly prove that the Bible is wrong. Don't believe it. It's a setup. The devil's setting you up. Don't fall for it. What's rule number one? There are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number one. Rule number two. 
If Bill Nye, the science guy, says there's a mistake in the Bible, refer to rule number one. There are no mistakes in the Bible. Amen? That's thus saith the Lord, by the way. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the patience that you have with us. And Father, we are going to be tried. We are going to be tested. Because a faith that's not worth dying for is not worth living for. We're going to be tried. We're going to be tested. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be mocked. People are going to make fun of us. They're going to try to lie to us. They're going to try to deceive us. They're going to try to prove in some way that our Bible really isn't right. But Father, you said that your word was incorruptible. That it cannot ever be wrong. Ever. And Father, help us. Help us to pass the trials and the test and the temptation. Help us to not be Saul. Help us to not be the children of Israel. Help us to be Joshua and Caleb and Solomon and others, Lord, whose faith had been tried. And they suffered severe persecution and yet they still clung to your word. Father, I thank you, Lord, for bringing Pastor Rock to us this morning. I pray, God, that you would fill his heart with your word. Lord, I know a little bit about what he said he's going to preach today. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless it. Bless it for those that are here today. Bless it for those that are watching and listening online. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would confirm in us yet again just how right your Bible is in our lives. Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. And we thank you for this precious word that we have. May it be glorified today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.